Ann Tainer. I'm from the History Society, and we're here today to interview Tim Stickney. Good morning. Who grew up on the key, and he's going to tell us hopefully some funny stories along with what the key was like way back when he was here. So, Tim? Hi, my name's Tim Stickney, and um, I came here in 1965 in the middle of my fourth grade. Uh, year and um, my father was transferred here. He was an FBI agent. He himself was a native of Miami. He was born in Miami. Grandfather was from here and our great-grandfather actually was from Key West. So we've been here a long time. I was in North Miami for a few months when dad first got transferred here and uh, that's why we came in the middle. I was uh, nine years old when I came to Key Biscayne and I think that was back in 19, again, 1965. We're always active at St. Agnes, too, right? From fourth grade, I was an altar boy yeah. at the church. Uh, my father was a lector, yeah. again, with uh, Jose Ortega, Umberto. We went up together as altar boys, uh, elementary school, junior high school, and then as well in uh, high school. Now, currently, I'm a, a lector yeah. at uh, the church. My wife was a school teacher, right. uh, my wife Doreen. Um, gosh, for I know she's been a teacher. She's going to be mad at me for not remembering exactly, but I know she was. She taught for forty years, probably thirty years, maybe even a little longer at St. Agnes Academy. Right. So my son was confirmed there. He went there. My daughter was uh, my daughter Katie. My son Michael. Uh, both attended St. Agnes Academy. Um, my son, again, was confirmed there. My daughter uh, was baptized there yeah. and confirmed there. So we've had a long history, history at St. Agnes Church. Uh, my fourth grade teacher was Ms. Butler. Oh, okay. Fifth grade, I had Ms. Byrne. And in sixth grade, I think it was Ms. Cavalier. Oh, very good. And I went to Belen. Jesuit oh, prep school yes. when, when it was over on Southwest 8th Street oh, yes. uh, by Packer Pontiac, right, right. Uh, 8th Street and 7th Avenue, I believe it was. And then I went to Coral Gables High School, yeah. where I uh, graduated from in 1973. And played, and played football for Coach Cody's. I did. <laughs> I was actually on Coach Cody's very last team. Uh, I was a linebacker. I was on his last team and, you know, as a junior. And then we had Coach Gary Gormley in his first year, in my senior year. In your senior year. I was still a kid when Calusa Park uh, came into being. Okay. At, as I recall, we had meetings or events right. at the elementary school, but then they, they built Calusa Park at the, you know, off the traffic circle right. where it right. is today. Right. But that wasn't originally what happened. But then we started playing there right. shortly thereafter, and we started at where it, where it currently right. is. But, you know, it's, it's funny. Old Kibis Caners are, are strange about this. Um, that was off the main beaten path right. of the right. key. Right. That so wasn't really the key. it never really was as successful as it could have been right. if it would have been on the main part of the key. Right. But there wasn't any land right. for that, or the land was too valuable. So they, they did it off the traffic right. circle there. Right. And uh, I still think to this day, the reason that it hasn't been as successful as it could have been is because it wasn't on the main part of the key. The Playhouse was interesting. I'm sure you remember. I, I actually went to church there when it was on the, when the mm. Playhouse was uh, a, the Episcopal Church on, on the original part mm -hmm. of the track of land on the plantation. The ocean side of the key and it was probably right around where the um, Key Colony is now. I think, I think it was right around in that area. And then they had the little golf course over here. Did you have a little nine par golf little nine, course? Yeah, par nine golf course. Wow. And the pro used to go home at 4 or 30 or something, and everybody on the Key would go over there at 5. Because <laughs> 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 it didn't cost anything. Key this game was kind of a cheap crowd, as yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So when you were on the key, what kind of things did you do when you first came here? Most of my friends were here on Key Biscayne. We used to go to Pines Canal, 
where they had a big swing, rope swing and yeah. we'd swing there. Back in those days, the state park was not in existence yet. Right. So we used to go and wander around all back in there. All the kids used to go to the skating rink, oh, yeah. which is right next to and part of yeah, right. the old yeah, zoo. Yeah. And so it was really pretty neat. We did that every Friday night. Yeah. We would go, our parents right. would take us right. and uh, leave us all to the skating rink, which was, which was again yeah. uh, near or right part of the zoo. And it's still there. It's a big round circle yeah. and it's smooth, yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, a, it's a little roller rink Every, it was the place to go on Friday nights. I think we may, may have had to pay for the, the skates. Yeah. Because, yeah, we would rent the skates. It wasn't an, an entrance fee per se. Right. It was, you rented the skates. Rent um, we also used to have a, a lot of uh, parties at different people's houses right. when we were kids. Uh, we could walk the streets at night, yeah. uh, although our parents didn't let us stay out very late. Right. But things were different also because it was a lot less crowded. I mean, the, the population has grown exponentially here. So it was different in that regard. When the park was built, there was cabanas. And I know one year we rented a cabana, uh -huh. you know, and I think several people from, from the key did. Uh, I'm sure you went on the little train and oh, the, yes. the carousel like you know, the rest of us. I did go around in that little train yeah. around the zoo. Uh, that was the Miami-Dade County, then called Dade County. That was the Dade County Zoo right. at that time. There was no big zoo that we have down in South Miami. Yeah. Yeah. This was the Dade County Zoo. It's now called Quiet Gardens. That's the old That's zoo. That's the old zoo. All of that in there is the old zoo. As an old key rat, although you all have to understand we did not, we were not called key rats back in those right, days, right. okay? But as a kid that grew up from the key, there were ways to get into the zoo without going through the front door. Right. And uh, if you did have to pay, I never did. Yeah. The zoo was a really cool place. Yeah. It was, you know, they had Lions and tigers and bears, right. oh no. Oh yeah, they had bears, they had, well it was a typical zoo of the time right. where all the animals were in cages and they had, you know, every kind of animal there was. They, they really did. They really um, did, it was quite a, quite a good zoo. They had a, truly a, a large variety of animals. It was right. unfortunate because they were in cages. Right. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have a zoo like that today. Right. And thank goodness for that, but um, as zoos went back in the day, back it in those was, days, it was, nice it was a pretty neat yeah. zoo. A lot of people used yeah. to come there yeah. back in uh, the early 60s, uh, early and mid 60s. Um, again, remember, there weren't all the buildings that are here now and the construction and such and not as many people. At night, you could hear the lions roar. They were in cages, so yeah. I wasn't yeah. scared, yeah. but you could hear on a quiet night, yeah. Yeah. if the wind was blowing in the yeah. right direction, yeah. You could hear the lions roar. You know, and Dr. Hubble, who was the then vet, lived here on the key. Right. And they did a lot of research there, too. And Dr. Hubble was quite famous for shark teeth. Yes. And he has an exhibit at Smithsonian for the shark teeth. Yes. And uh, he had one at his house. Did you ever go to his house? No, the you know what? I never did, but I knew it was there, but I, nev <laughs> I never did go to his house. But Dr. Hu Dr. Hubble was big cheese. Okay, he really was here yeah. on the key. Uh, he was well known and uh, and a well respected. The little bridge you used to walk over, and everybody used to look down at the big alligator. Right. I think they're still there, as right. a matter of fact. The pits are still there, yeah. And I think there's a couple of alligators that are still there. Way back in the beginning of the key, it was so easy to just go fish almost anywhere off sure. of the dock or off of the land and, and catch something. Sure. You, know? you, know, you could go fishing off the seawall, catch just a ton of fish. Yeah. Um, my favorite place was over on behind uh, uh, some houses or vacant lots on Mashed Island. Oh, yeah. uh, at that time, we'd go out and just catch a ton of fish. It was fantastic. Right. 
The interesting part about the early Key Biscayne was there was 361. That was the number. So whenever anybody asked you your phone number, you only gave them the last four numbers. <laughs> that's, that's right, because everything was 361. You didn't have to dial 305. Yeah. And there was no 365. Right. It was, it was all 361. What's your number? 8144, yeah. 2536, 1590. Yeah. You didn't have to say 361 because yeah, everybody. They were easier to remember that way, too. Yeah, that's right. Well, you only had to remember four numbers. <laughs> there was a, a close-knit community back then, Oh. I think more so than, than even now. Oh, very much so. Um, this was settled by veterans. Right. And so a lot of the people that settled here way back when, in the 50s and early 60s, were veterans. Right. And so they had that in common. Right. Uh, and they started a yacht club. Right. And uh, so there was lots of fun and activities there. But as veterans and a much smaller community, um, it was, I agree with you, I think you're right, it was a much closer knit community. In actuality, that's why Matheson kind of started the houses out here was for the veterans. You know, they could get a VA loan and, and the houses didn't cost much, so. Uh, it was actually developed for right. the benefit right. of veterans. Right. Um, way back in 19, I think, 52 yeah. is when, 52, 52 54, 54, right, yeah, in there. right in there. So, uh, yes, that's why, that's why we had so many veterans yeah. Right off the uh, yeah, bat. most of them, most of them from the veterans went into uh, airline pilots because mm -hmm. there was an enormous amount of airline pilots. Um, That's right. Over here. Uh, not the affluent neighborhood that it is now. No. Uh, not hardly. Different in that regard. There were also there was nothing on the beach right. except for the island house right. and the beach club. That's right. That's uh, right. There, there was nothing. Yeah. Um, this is even before. A lot of the little apartments, when you would go to the beach, there was nothing yeah, there yeah, except yeah. woods. Right. And um, you go down to the beach club and have fun at the beach club, eat hot dogs yeah. and hamburgers. Shopping centers. I think there was only like maybe one or two. That, that's correct. Um, you know, we had 7-Eleven, yeah. but uh, that was just about, uh, almost about it. Um, we had the Key Biscayne Shopping Center. I remember as a kid, you know, Bristol's. Bristol's uh, was the, the big store. toy store yeah. out here. Um, there was no Winn Dixie yeah. uh, or anything like that. Oh, gosh, I can't remember the name of the, the Simpsons. Simpsons. That's right. <laughs> it was Simpsons, yeah. a little grocery store there, and a few shops. But that that really was it. That was it. That was it. Yeah. The Silver Sands. Yeah. That. Uh, the bar that they was, had there yeah, that would that look out was, over the ocean, yeah. and then they later built the uh, upstairs one right. that, was, uh, that was really great, the, and the uh, sandbar. And the sandbar, as we can say, and the <laughs> restaurant that, that had a, they, everybody said, oh, it's a waterfall, but actually it was a hose on the top that, <laughs> that had water trickling down. That's know? right. That's right, <laughs> dude. Everybody, everybody called it the restaurant with the waterfall. That's yeah. right, the old sandbar. You yeah. could, if you were sitting at the bar, <clears throat> You could look out. They had a big plate yeah. glass window, right. and you could look out to the sand to the sandbar, right, hence right, the name. Right. And water was coming down yeah, from that yeah, hose. Yeah. That's right. I was a busboy there oh, really? for a while. Oh, yes, right I there. sure was. No, so they, the Key Biscayne Hotel was kind of something you went to when there was a special occasion. It was more formal. It was more formal. Oh, the Silver yeah. Sands and the sandbar at the Silver Sands Motel right. yeah. was really, as far as I was concerned, that was the place where I. Right. I would go that or the old keyhole. Oh, well, the other thing we didn't cover was the Jamaica Inn. Yeah, the Jamaica English Inn keyhole, the yeah. English, the Jamaica Inn and the English pub was really, uh, and on any given, they used to have specials, and you could go there on, uh, I don't know, any given night and see half the key there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The old English pub, uh, and then particularly later, the, the upstairs, Jamaican. the upstairs bar. The Jamaica Inn was the, of the two, was the Jamaican was a little more formal right. and had a, just a tremendous menu. It was yeah. actually... We had a rehearsal dinner there. Okay. Well, it was an excellent, <laughs> excellent yeah. uh, restaurant. And then the less formal was the pub. The pub, yeah. 
And, um, and the pup was a, a really true English pup. Yeah. It wasn't unusual to see people screaming back and forth and arguing about something. Oh, and absolutely. Was, there was always entertainment at these places. Oh, <laughs> I can remember my, my dad. My, my father was an FBI agent. And um, <laughs> he got a, a call, and there was one of the FBI's wanted fugitives there. And I believe it was Carl Young, the old longtime manager at the Keeps Game Beach Club. And he called Dad and said, Tom, I think so-and-so is here. And, and it turns out he was there. It was a fugitive that was there that was looking that uh, the FBI was looking for. So he and I think Terry Nelson was, I think he was involved. I may be mistaken about that. But they went in there and made a big, and it was him. And they, they made a big arrest there. And, uh, and Egg Young, Carl Young, the, man, the old manager of the uh, beach club way back when, uh, pointed him out. You know, and my dad was going, no, you know, not, you know, they didn't want anything to happen yet. But, um, but they, made, they made their arrest. I mean, the pub, the old English pub was quite a place. It was quite a was was quite a place. The fun part about the key, I think, for me, being here for so long, I'm sure you too. I mean, there's there's a plus side and a downside to it. Everybody knew everybody else, but everybody knew everybody else's business too. And there was <laughs> nothing that got by anybody. That's true. I mean, if anything was going on, but you know, through thick or thin, yes, you knew what was going on on the key with everybody here. That's you right. Know? You you. <laughs> You really did. She tells no lie. Um, it was a fascinating, I'm sure, for our parents uh, because everybody did really okay. know what everybody else was doing. Yeah. Um, but uh, I grew up here, and it was a fabulous, fabulous place to grow up. I, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't pick any other place in the world, I don't think. Um, it, was, it was truly, it was great. And, and, you know, uh, as a testament to that, we still have a lot of people that grew up here that have come back right. and live here. Okay. Yeah, Just Rafael that. Portella, Tutti Portella, yeah. that's Tutti, uh, Jose Ortega, yeah. uh, the Tellums, the whole, a whole group of Tellums, um, just, to, just to name a few. There are a lot more, but um, they, you know, it's, it was a great place to grow up right. and still a great place to live. They would do scouts, Scou and they, they would do, that's right. they, they did sailing programs in summer camp at the Yacht Club, that's and, right. and um, it, it just seemed like any time a parent wanted to do something or had an idea to do something for the children, everybody would jump in and support them. So. I, agree, I agree with that. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, it was a great place to grow up as a kid. Right. Um, parents were actually active. Yeah, they bad. they would attend yeah. the various events, the different games. Parents would be lining the sideline when um, when uh, Mr. Ralph Foster oh, yeah. uh, started the very first soccer team right. on Key Biscayne, and I had the the privilege of being on it. My dad would run up and down that sideline, and it was always the parents always attended those games. Those games. Um, the community was very active. The Christmas tree sales for the yeah. athletic club. Yes. They were trying to raise money and they would do Christmas tree sales. Right. So every, I think about every parent on the key, mm -hmm. you would call them and say, okay, you have to go sell Christmas trees from whatever time. Yeah, and they would go, oh, okay. They might, they might not like it, but they were there. There was certainly wailing and gnashing of teeth and groaning, right. but they did come they did and, come and they, did they did sell the trees. Things. That, that is one thing that I do kind of miss about the key now. And that is, um, when I was growing up, um, there was a lot more participation by the people that lived here in the various community activities. The Christmas tree sale was, uh, that Ann was just discussing was, was an example of that. My, my father and uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Foster oh, yeah. started the Key Cane Athletic Club for the benefit of the kids out here. Right. They would do things like that because we all wanted to play. Mr. Foster said, hey, yeah. would you guys like to play soccer? Yeah. And we had no clue, but we went ahead and said, sure, yeah, I'd love to play soccer. 
I was on along with uh, Tudy Portella, uh, Jose Ortega, Lynn Morris, a bunch of bunch of old timers, um, Mark Yaley, uh, Richard Copper. If I forget any of you guys, I apologize. But we were on yeah. the very first soccer right. team Key Biscayne ever had. Yeah. And did y'all play other teams in town, or did you oh, just yes. intramurals here? No, no. This was a, uh, I guess they call it now a, uh, a traveling team. Traveling. No, we used to play uh, Miami Shores, uh, Coral Gables Youth Center, um, uh, North Miami. There was another team in North Miami. Um, great rivals with right. Cutler Ridge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those were some of the teams that we used and to play. And if I remember correctly, it was all done by parents? Yes. 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 Well, Mr. Foster was the focal point and we had a great group of parents yeah. the parents were really very supportive they were the ones basically that funded everything right. and they would <laughs> they would attend the uh the soccer games the reason i'm chuckling is that you know they got they got shall we say high spirited yes <laughs> during the course of the games my father uh a retired at the time uh, a retired fbi agent would run up and down the field, and, and when he thought I should be kicking the ball, he'd kick. And uh, he did so one time and kicked the legs right out from a gentleman who he didn't even know. Oh. <laughs> and so and he apologized. You know, he was, yeah. he was mortified. Oh, he would yeah. apologize, but he kicked the legs right out from under yeah. the guy. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's, that's one of my recollections. And, and, uh, uh, but the parents were very active, very involved in... Uh, our soccer program, and in the community in general. Yeah. It seemed back then there was a lot of, of community activities in reference to the grown-ups as well as the kids <clears throat> that used to take place. And I know a lot of them took place at the Yacht Club, but back then it seemed like everybody was always welcome. And they were. Everybody came where they were members or not. So I, think be, that's, I think that's a fair statement. <clears throat> it did seem like it was more community-oriented, uh, back then but of course it was a lot smaller yeah. there was a much smaller yeah. population and um, again there was more in common with each other because of the fact that there were so many veterans right. Right. and uh, people that originally settled the key right. for all you people out there watching you need to become involved in the community right. that's one of the things that made the history of Key Biscayne so great was the participation of the residents here on Key Biscayne. Don't sit back and let someone else do something for you. Go out there, go yourself and do it, okay? If I would admonish anybody out here on Key Biscayne, it's the failure of that. Not by everybody there. We still have lots of great volunteers out here. But we could always use more. And there are a lot more people on Key Biscayne now than there was 40, 50 years ago. And so volunteer, pick anything, but volunteer for one of the organizations. Come out, help your kids, support your kids. That's what, that's what made and will continue to make Key Biscayne what it is today. I lived on the Key in 66 with um, a roommate and then I met my husband at that time or a little thereafter and we got married in 68. This was the only place he wanted to live, period. We were boaters, had a boat, and so we joined the Yacht Club. Uh, Mr. Stickney was one of the first people that came up and got uh, Jim and I involved in the Yacht Club. She says Mr. Stickney, she means my dad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not talking about Tim. And, and I'm not sure Somewhere along the way, Tim came into the picture, and it probably was through the love of boating and, yes, and, absolutely. and the yacht club, and, and just, you know, being on the key, you kind of got to know people. That, that's true, and, and Jim found out that I liked to dive. Jim liked to dive, too, and so we would go out crawfishing during the season, legally, yeah. um, which was kind of un-Key Rat style, right. uh, but we would go out in Jim and Ann's boat, get a bunch of crawfish yeah. and crawfish for those of you that aren't natives here are lobster we don't mean the little crawfish that right. come that you find in creeks 
We'd go out, get our limit, come back, and we'd go diving all the time. The Yacht Club was really the center of the social. And I remember your mother fondly, well, along with your father. And they were both very active in the community here, yes. always. And mom was active in the Yacht Club, and my dad was the uh, uh, little tidbit of information. Right. He was the 25th Commodore yeah. of the Yacht Club, and I was and the 50th, 50th. Commodore right. Right. of the Yacht Club. Right. So yeah, they were, they were both very active on on Key Biscayne. Yeah. Bonfires on the beach, because we used to do that <laughs> before it was a state park. I have an older brother, Tom, and um, he used to take dates down to yeah. the uh, to the beach yeah. and have bonfire. Right, that's what Joe and I did that, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. right. And I got one of the worst beatings of my life from my older brother because he caught me spying on him. Know. <laughs> you know, he had gone down with the, you know, other couples right. and they were having a good time at the beach and at night. And uh, he heard a little, I, I must have stepped on a twig or something. I don't know what it was. But the next thing I knew, he, had, he snuck around behind me. And oh, it was a bad, it was a bad night. It was a bad night. Back in those days, you were allowed to, you, you're allowed to do that. So going down to uh, uh, Beer Can Beach right. was what right. they right. used to call it, uh, and building big bonfires and things right. like that, yes. How did your father feel about Nixon when he was here? Well, he was still working then, and um, as an FBI agent, right. he was, even though the FBI is not, of course, the right. agency that's responsible right. for taking care of the president, all of those, there were there were some more agents that were living out right. here at the time as right. well. Um, you know, they were always ready, ready. prepared yeah. and to do whatever was necessary yeah. back then. Um, I remember it was kind of a pain in the neck for a little while because they had the boats right. out. Right. And so there was a large protective right. area right. where as a little room. kid going out right. in a little Boston whaler or yeah. some other boat, we had to go all the way around and then come back, go all the way back around because that was the guarded that area. Was the guarded you know, area. Key Biscayne back then, the way it was, and even still now today, why would you want to leave Key Biscayne? Yeah. People come here right. most of the time. Um, I love Miami, was raised here, truly is unique. I agree. The only reason I go off the key is to go do certain specific kind of shopping, go right. see a movie or things right. like that. Right. You can go downtown and have the advantage of a big city right. and then leave that big city and come back to Key Biscayne. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, for all of you that are watching this, consider yourselves blessed that you have that ability because um, you can come back to Key Biscayne as opposed to staying in, in uh, in the big city of Miami, if that's what you like, and I do. Do you think the key is over the years has gotten overdeveloped? To a certain extent? <laughs> well, being someone who grew up here, when there was nothing along the beach except again right. the Island House right. and the Beach Club, and then the old Key Biscayne Hotel. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is. Unfortunately, to me now it's it's overcrowded. The beautiful views that you could see going down the beach are, are to me kind of lost because uh, they're all buildings there yeah. now. How did you get involved in the in the Fourth of July? Is the uh... I have been blessed or cursed, depending on your point of view with a gift of gab. Yeah. So someone said, hey, Stick, why don't you be the master of ceremonies? I was there with, when Dr. Hanworker oh, yeah. was there. And I think it was Wendy Crowder. Oh, wow. I think That's it was Wendy Crowder. Best. I said, sure, give me a microphone. And uh, as you can tell, I'm shy and humble here too. But um, I got on that microphone and 30 years later, I finally uh, retired from doing that. Well, you always did a great job. Well, thank you. Happy birthday, America!
My wife, Doreen, uh, and Monica Ortega oh, yeah. um, would do my makeup. I always had a, a patriotic oh, yeah. face at that time. And, um, and as time grew on, I, I went and got more, <laughs> more garb. More, yeah. and, uh, Each year you added a layer. Uh, that's right. That is actually correct. Each year there was something a little different yeah. than the year before. And that was a little little thing of mine yeah. that I do, used to do. Do you miss that? First couple of years, I didn't because I was I was just I was frankly I was tired. But I miss it now. I think I uh, I'm going to ask the current master of ceremonies, <laughs> Austin, tell him uh, if I can make some sort of guest appearance or something at oh. some point in time, yeah. and uh, and I'll add something to my costume then too if he says yeah, yes. But. Um, uh, I announced the parade again for, for 30 years. It was one of the joys, but I just, I, <laughs> I started getting older and I would get tired. I'd go home after the parade and I, I would collapse. Uh, I used to go to my next door neighbor, Jose Ortega's, uh, that's Umberto, there being a ton of brothers, all named Jose. Umberto's and Ruthie, yeah. I go to, they, they had a swimming pool, still do. Right. They're still our next door neighbors. And I'd jump in that pool, dry off, and come home, and I'd be out for a couple of hours. Yeah. And as I got older, that got kind of tough. tough yeah. My knees started yeah. to <laughs> ache, <laughs> and I was just worn out. Yeah. Just yeah. worn out. But I loved doing it. Yeah. I do miss it now. Yeah. Um, Austin Tellum has Sorry, done a just yeah. great, yeah. great job. Yeah. But I'm going to see if I can sneak in. Sneak in Something a year or two, here, yeah. next Fourth of July parade, and do right, that, right. and uh, just for a little while. Right. I can't do a whole parade, right. I don't think, yeah. anymore. <laughs> I don't know. Counter Choppers was a unique group. The guy that ran it lived around the corner from me, two houses over. Yeah. So we used to hear him practice all the time. And they were basically a group of characters, wouldn't you agree? Yes, because one of them was my father. <laughs> my father was a chowder chomper. Antics. He played the, the, the big bass drum Whoa. and the cymbals. Dad was a chowder chomper. Yeah. Um, and I have some great pictures of him. Uh, in all his glory, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Play, playing the, the big bass drum and, or, or yeah. clashing the cymbals. But they always had a good time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. They had a really good time. That's, that's for sure. Well, that, that's typical of Kibish Caners, yeah. uh, particularly back in those days. Um, yeah, they, <laughs> they knew how to have a good time, and they did. They've been in the parade. They've been a presence in the parade as long as I can recall. He used to march in, you know, the wildest gear and, and really have a good time with it. And then everybody thought it was so much fun. They kept adding members and That's adding right. members. That's you right. Know? And then they, they, I think at the end, they actually were on a, a float of some kind. Well, they started getting older. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and it was hot, you know. That, that's a, yeah, during the, the yeah, parade, that's, that's a long it. walk. And uh, especially if you're holding a, a heavy right, instrument, right. they loved it. They were, they were a staple. They were a big part of the parade. I remember over the parade, and then the big thing was everybody on the whole island was always invited to the yacht club afterwards. Right. And the chowder choppers were always there entertaining. That's right. You know? That's right. They sure so, were. Uh, that was always fun to sit and watch them.
And the entertainment wasn't always necessarily because of their music. It was, yeah, that's true. Okay. That's true. That's very true. Sometimes yeah. it was watching them trying yeah. to play their music. Yeah. Betsy, what was so bad about Hurricane Betsy yeah, back then? Good. We went to North Miami. My father took us to some friends in North Miami. And I'm glad we did because my parents' house at that time over on Ridgewood Road, we had uh, 18 inches of salt water inside the house. We lived over by the elementary school at that time. And so we had 18 inches of salt water. And we had parquet floors, and they all just went pop, 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 pop. We lost all the floors and, and all of that. But Hurricane Betsy was a minimal hurricane. It was Hurricane Betsy. It, it flooded salt water. We had dead fish in our yard. It came over the key. You have to remember, all the buildings that are on the key there, they weren't there. They weren't there. The buildings weren't here, and also you have to understand it was uh, sometime after that that the Florida insurance required homes to be built up at least 12. Yeah, something. There has to be a, a level now. Well, that didn't exist. Most of the houses were extremely low. Again, get behind a bicycle and have, you know, and tow on what we called scurf boards back then, or they're skim boards. Yeah. But, you know, we'd get a guy on a bicycle and he'd tow. Uh, or if my brother was feeling like it, he would get in the car and tow us. Yeah. But we could go all over the island because all the roads were underwater. Right. And uh, it, was, it was really something growing up here. Really, really something. The interesting part to me about Andrew was all of a sudden the key turned back into the old key. Mm -hmm. Everybody was right. helping everybody else. Everybody was there for everybody else. You helped your neighbor, you helped, if you, if you went to get food, you brought some back from your neighbor. And we didn't have a telephone service, and my neighbor across the way didn't have uh, electric, so we ran cords back and forth. You know, uh, we ran uh, telephone cords and electric right. cords back and forth. So it was a time that the key really, really came together. It, Doreen and I and our two children, Michael and Katie, went down if you recall, it was Hurricane Andrew was forecast to hit North Miami and right. South Broward. Oh. So when I came back, I, <laughs> my wife will never forgive me for this, but I was in Bimini at the time when Hurricane Andrew was coming. But I shot back across the Gulf Stream, docked the boat, and we went because it was supposed to hit North Miami and South Broward. We south. went south. Yeah. Half of the we, key went south. We went south and stayed well, with Alan and Jackie Thayer, who used to live on the key, that aren't very far from Pinecrest. Well, yeah, as we all know, Hurricane Andrew took a little jot south instead of north, like they thought it might. And we went right through the eye. The eye passed directly over where we were. And um, uh, it was uh, quite an experience because I, I went through Hurricane Betsy as a little as a, as a little boy, and that was a little scary. But um, uh, my poor wife Doreen, who's from New Jersey, had never been through a hurricane before, and this was her first one. And um, the the walls inside Jackie and Alan Thayer's house started to shake. And things were looking kind of bleak, so we put everybody in the bathroom, which is what you're supposed to do. And um, fortunately, uh, we survived, although the sliding glass doors got sucked out of the house. It was, it was really quite an experience. And um, we came back, you know, then we came back to, to the key. And I consider ourselves very fortunate. Um, we had some damage, but not as not nearly what like happened. Say, it, where homestead and and uh, it, it was just it was it was horrible. We had a lot of dead fish in the house, uh, not in the house, uh, but in the yard and yeah. things like that, and you know some trees, right. but nothing compared to what happened, what happened down, down south. Yeah. Nothing, and I couldn't believe it. Or I had been in Bimini just just a couple days beforehand in our old uh, Chris Craft uh, named Suds. And right before the hurricane, I drove back across the Gulf Stream, docked the boat at uh, Raul Gutierrez's house, 
uh, across the bay, came back, got my wife and two kids, my poor wife from New Jersey who had never been through a hurricane before, and Andrew was her first. Um, took her back to uh, Jackie and Alan Thayer's, and of course the hurricane, instead of hitting North Miami, hit South Miami and, and, and Homestead and such. And uh, we were all, <laughs> it, was, it was an experience because instead of avoiding the hurricane, I took my family right smack in the, almost in the middle of it. I think that was about half of the key though. I think about half of the key did the same thing that went south. Well, it was you forecast know, to hit, hit yeah. North Miami and, yeah. and South Broward. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's what yeah, we did. That's what everybody did. And uh, I welcomed Doreen to keep his game. Yeah. She was down here. She was a school teacher in uh, New Jersey, right. and she was down here for a break. And uh, a friend of hers introduced us, and it's uh, it's really kind of something because I, I knew uh, my friend Greg Turp, Greg and Sally Turp, um, introduced me to Doreen, and I knew the moment I saw her. This is one of those stories. I knew the moment that I saw her that this is the one. This was the one. I, I looked at her and I was spellbound and starstruck and I knew she was the one. And uh, I even surprised her. She went back up to New Jersey. She didn't live here. And so she went back up to New Jersey and uh, through a friend of hers, I went up there and surprised her. She did not know I was coming. I knocked on her door and the tears began to flow because she didn't know I was coming and uh, wow. there you have it. And the rest, as they say, is history. It was a great story. I had never been up north before. Wow. So I flew up to New Jersey and surprised her. Well, truth be told, I got the number of one of her friends so that I made sure that Doreen was home. And that was the first time I'd ever been up north wow. like that. First time I ever saw New York City, because she lived fair, she lives, lived in the northeast corner of New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey yeah. And uh, I went there and was all excited. Yeah. I even made the taxi cab driver stop the car because I saw the Empire State Building. I didn't care about yeah. the World Trade Center. I wanted where King Kong had been on top of the Empire State Building, by golly. And so I made it. I, had, I actually did make him yeah. stop the car so I could, go, I could look at it across the river and uh, the Hudson. And uh, so I knocked on her door, and uh, she was very surprised. <laughs> always wanted incorporation and the main reason that everybody wanted it was the fire and the police. Unfortunately, the police department was um, over town. That was their priority and then we were second. So um, I think everybody on the key just about had an opinion about incorporation and it was probably in the beginning about half and half. Yes, and, and, that's um, fair. But, you know, we stood on the corner, we went downtown to the hearings, and I even took my kids out of school to go down there. But it's, um, I think it was one of the better things the key, the key did. Unfortunately, I think the backlash of that is, after incorporation, I don't think for, um, I think there was more volunteerism before and now I think they kind of depend on, on uh, the village to do. I agree with you 100% um, that, in that aspect. Um, yeah, some of the volunteerism that used to exist on Key Biscayne uh, doesn't really exist anymore. Um, you know, the attitude is, well, we have uh, village employees to right. do that now, so we don't need to do that. And because of that, I think we are a less tightly knitted community than we were in the past. Um, you know, we have uh, our own government, which by the way, I, I support, but one of the offshoots of that is less, I think less participation by the 
members of our community in things that our parents used to do. I'm glad that we're incorporated, and, and so don't get me wrong. But it would be nice to see more involvement of the members or the, or the population of Key Biscayne in the community. The downside of the key back then was there was only one traffic light. Yeah. Um, that was it. And um, the island is made like a bowl. I mean, it, it still goes on and people like are having a fit. And I remember it was always flooded. Mm -hmm. I had a little sports car when I first moved here, and it used to get flooded. <laughs> well, I had a 1956 Chevy in high school, and Ann is absolutely correct. It was my grandmother's. I really did buy it from a little old lady, because I bought it from my grandmother for $100. But I had a 1956 Chevy, and the floorboards rusted out. So there were literally holes in the back, on the floorboards in the back seat. And so you could go, and if it had rained, we had to put um, pieces of plywood over it because water would come up <laughs> through there. If people think the flooding is bad now, they have no clue. <laughs> they have no clue. Before the sewers were put in and all that, uh, no, you have no, folks, you really haven't a clue, okay? Because it used to go underwater I here. I when the fish were on the Harbor Drive, yeah. when there was a lot of water. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, you, you'd see fish floating. Um, I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm glad we incorporated and, I'm, and the improvements, but it was a different place. Yeah. It really was. Um, we used to throw skim boards, pieces of plywood that uh, yeah, we'd make, it, it, and it was called scurfing. Right. And we'd go scurfing or get behind a car and tow, yeah. and, you know, we'd ride those boards, right. um, things like that. Um, it was a different place. It was a different place. But it was flooded. Folks, if you think the, the streets are flooded now, you haven't a clue. Not a clue. But, but everybody actually thought it was like so much fun. I mean, yeah, you put was... your kids out there with, you know, they just, I mean, probably not real healthy, but kids would go out <laughs> there swimming and, oh, and yeah. you know, they go, anything they can get to float on, they would float on it. And, yeah. You know, it was like when it rained, it was like play day in the oh, city. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It was our version of a snow day. Right. <laughs> Well, that's a, actually a pretty good analogy. That's a pretty good analogy. Good it was analogy. our equivalent to a snow day. Yes. Um, but we had a lot of them. Yeah. What would you like the takeaway to be for the public as far as you being here on the key for so long and being raised here? Although the key has changed considerably, due mostly to the population increase in the building. Key Biscayne is still, in my mind, the most wonderful place in South Florida to live. I've been all over the place and I have yet to find a closer knit community, people that are as wonderful as they are, and the longtime friends that I've had. And it is my hope that all of you that are watching this will enjoy the same privilege that you have of living on Key Biscayne, to enjoy hopefully the same thing, the friendships, the close-knit community uh, that I've enjoyed again since um, 1964. Uh, I love this place. I, I would have to agree fully. Uh, it's a very unique place. As big as it's gotten, it's still unique. And uh, there's still a support group here that go back. And even even there's a new support group here. Yes. So I think um, it's very unique in that respect and we're very lucky to have it and be here. I think we're very fortunate. I think all of you, all the viewers out there, I hope you realize how fortunate you are too because this is a wonderful place, a safe place. You can walk the streets at night here. And that is a rare privilege <laughs> in Miami, Florida. Yes. So enjoy it. You need to become involved in the community. Right. That's one of the things that made the history of Key Biscayne so great. 
was the participation of the residents here on Key Biscayne. Don't sit back and let someone else do something for you. Go yourself and do it, okay? If I would admonish anybody out here on Key Biscayne, it's the failure of that. Not by everybody there. We still have lots of great volunteers out here. But we could always use more. And there are a lot more people on Key Biscayne now than there was 40, 50 years ago. And so volunteer. Pick anything. But volunteer for one of the organizations. Come out. Help your kids. Support your kids. That's what, that's what made and will continue to make Key Biscayne what it is today. We hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. And thank you, Tim, for coming and My pleasure. giving you this little synopsis. And hope to see you some, for some more interviews. Okay. It was a pleasure. Thank you.